Hi, and welcome to our webinar today, Fighting Fraud in Minority Communities. I want to thank everyone so much for joining us. My name is Laura Cook, uh, and I am the de Deputy Director of the Financial Crime Resource Center. The Financial Crime Resource Center is one of many programs of the National Center for Victims of Crime, uh, and the National Center started around 30 years ago uh, based upon the mission to forge a national commitment to help victims of crime rebuild their lives. The Financial Crime Resource Center, as I said, is one of the affiliates, and our mission is to help victims of financial crime recover and, and uh, recover assets and regain control over their lives. And we look at financial crime um, as the, it can be just as devastating as being a victim of violent crime. And we try to spread the word and uh, educate and inform people about financial crime as much as possible. We have a lot of great partners. Uh, our main partner is FINRA and the FINRA Ed Education Foundation. FINRA is a, the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, and they work with a lot of investors and in investment fraud issues. And the FINRA Investor Education Foundation uh, is helping to produce the, this webinar series, uh, and they award grants and manage targeted projects to help with investor education and protection. We have a great lineup of presenters today. Uh, per Patricia Poss is an attorney in the Division of Marketing Practices in the Federal Tr Commission's Bureau of Consumer Protection. Ms. Poss works to combat from lower income and underserved communities, serving on the agency's legal services collaboration and its Every Community Initiative. Ms. Poss has previously served as Chief of BCD's Mobile Technology Unit and Counsel to the Director of the Bureau. She also spent several years investigating and litigating consumer protection cases that challenge internet fraud, including phishing, spam, and telemarketing fraud. Ms. Poss is a graduate of the University of Minnesota Law School. Also is Lisa Weintraub Schifferly. Uh, she's an attorney with the FTC's Commission's Division of Consumer and Business Education. At the FTC, she regularly trains advocates across the country on identity theft and scams. Before arriving at the FTC, Ms. Schifferly spent eight years at the Millen Legal Aid Bureau as a staff attorney and supervising attorney. She received her BA, summa cum laude, from Yale College and her JD from the University of Virginia Law School. Mikhail Orenbaum is the coordinator of the Financial Stability Services Program at Kingdom House. After working with refugees and immigrants in the Bay Area after graduating from college, she attended Washington University in St. Louis where she received her master's degree in social work with a concentration in minority mental health. Upon graduation, she completed her licensure exam and took a full-time position at Kingdom House as the coordinator of financial stability. Kingdom House is a settlement house whose mission is to help people create better lives. In her role, she manages matching accounts, helps people become banked, provides financial coasting, hosts his financial capability classes, and works to build evidence-based programming to meet the needs of marginalized communities in St. Louis. We have Nathaniel Carroll. He's a staff attorney at the Arch City Defenders Incorporated, a not-for-profit law firm in St. Louis, Missouri. He works on civil rights class action litigation there. He's a graduate of St. Louis University School of Law and practices in Missouri and Illinois. He's also a member of the Pro Bono Task Force for the Bar Association of Metropolitan St. Louis. And last but not least, we've got Brett Murphys. Brett Murphys, sorry about that, works on Texas Appleseed's Fair Financial Services Project and provides support for our projects. Brett first joined Texas Appleseed in 2012 working on foster care and fair financial services. She also has experience working as a legislative aide on Capitol Hill, as an associate at Patton Boggs LLP, and as the political director for a work center. Received a Juris Doctor from the University of Virginia Law School, where she was a member of the Virginia Law Review Editorial Board and founded the Feminist Legal Forum. She received a Master of Public Policy from the Stanford School at Duke University and her undergraduate degree from Wellesley College. I want to thank all of the presenters so much for their willingness to participate and lend their expertise to us today. And with that, um, the and Lisa, I will pass the presentation over to you. Wonderful. Hello, everyone. My name is Patty Poss. Um, as, uh, as it was just introduced, I'm with the Federal Trade Commission. I want to make one um, change to that. I'm not in our Bureau of Technology anymore. I am in our Bureau of Consumer Protection in our um, a Division of Marketing Practices. And over the slides here, there we go. 
Uh, and uh, as I said, I'm uh, an attorney in our Division of Marketing Practices. Lisa and I both work for the Federal Trade Commission, and we're really happy to be with you here today. I do want to make our, our disclosure that we are not commissioners, so our views are our own, and we don't represent necessarily the views of the commission or any uh, one commissioner. Um, but we are happy to be here today and to share with you what we know um, uh, and what we have learned from some of the, the work that we've been doing here at Bureau of Consumer Protection at the FTC. And a lot of what we're providing with today is, uh, comes from a report we issued called Combating Fraud in African American and Latino Communities, the FTC's Comprehensive Strategic Plan. So you see that that report is available on the FTC's website. If you just go to ftc.gov, um, you can find that report if you just put that in the search bar. Uh, this was a report that we did to Congress last June. Um, uh, Congress had asked us to say, you know, take a look at what are the issues and, and come up with a comprehensive strategic plan. And we were delighted to do so. Um, it kind of brought together a lot of the various work we've been doing in an initiative that, that I work on and Lisa works on that we call our Every Community Initiative, where we're looking at how frauds and scams affect different communities um, and, and what we can do to marshal our resources to make sure we're being the most effective in reaching and preventing fraud in those communities. So I'm going to share with you a little bit more about our report and what we've learned and what our plan is going forward. Agenda for our presentation actually matches how things were out in our report, but I'll give you a little overview of the report. Uh, and then Lisa's going to talk, share with you some information about partnering with the FTC and our free resources. Started. I have trouble clicking. Not sure why not. There we go. Consumer fraud problem. Um, it is a problem, and in fact, our latest uh, consumer fraud survey, the FTC does a prevalent study um, every so often, and this was our last one. It's a few years old, but we, uh, you can see the numbers there of, of an estimated 10.8% of the U.S. adults were victims of fraud. Most concerning, or very concerning in that report uh, is the next bullet there, which is African-American and Latino consumers were more likely to become fraud victims than non-Hispanic whites. Um, and in fact, African Americans were almost twice as likely to have experienced one or more of the surveyed frauds as non-Hispanic whites uh, in that survey. And two particular types of fraud stood out for their disproportionate effect. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about those, but it's debt-related frauds. These are scams that are related to debt. Income-related frauds. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about those. Underreporting a fraud. Um, one of the things the report highlights is this issue, which we have certainly heard from many of you, um, uh, from consumer groups, from other law enforcement. As we've been doing conferences and outreach throughout the country, we often hear this. Um, and so in our report, we kind of pulled together some of the things we have heard um, uh, that, you know, people may be embarrassed, they may know where to report fraud, they think it will make a difference or may not want any contact with the government at all. And I'm, I'm guessing none of you are surprised um, at seeing that, those, those things there, but I just want to put that out there. A lot of things apply to everybody, uh, but certainly heard it specifically from folks who work um, in African-American and Latino communities. And all of this, we know that reporting fraud is critical. It does make a difference. That's how law enforcement, like the FTC and others, that we work with other state, local, and federal law enforcement groups, that how we learn about fraud, how we bring cases, how we see trends, and how we prioritize. So it's really important that everyone's voice is heard. So reporting fraud um, is critical. And so it really is one of the main messages of this report is um, we want to hear more so that we're able to do more to combat these frauds. report, we provided some, um, some, we looked at some of our data and we provided some analysis of the data. So the Federal Trade Commission has a system called the Consumer Sentinel System, which is a, our complaint system. So people out the country can submit complaints. They can do it online at our ftc.gov website. You can click on the complaint to system to file a complaint. Um, and people can submit complaints by calling um, our offices and they can, they can actually submit complaints in Spanish also. Um, they're online or through our telephone system. 
So we get a lot of complaints. We also get complaints submitted to us through uh, state AG's offices, the Better Business Bureau forwards complaints, the CFPB forwards complaints, lots of different agencies and entities that we work with can put complaints into our Consumer Sentinel system. And that's really important for us, not just us, but other law enforcement, because um, that system is used by other agencies who also can get secure logins, law enforcement, to look in and look at the complaints in their state, look at the complaints that are in their topic areas, um, and, and use it for, obviously, for targeting, for finding cases, but also to see patterns and trends, as I mentioned. So research in our, um, in our report, we, we worked with an analyst um, to look at some of that data, those complaint data. So as you can see in this chart here, this is looking at the complaint rates for various communities in 2015. So they took all the complaints that came into us from uh, the year 2015, and then they took that information. That, so many of those complaints included the victims or the consumers' um, zip code, where they, were, where they lived. And analysts mapped those zip codes to the Census Bureau data at, for zip codes. Exactly, it's called ZACTAs, but they matched them up to help us understand some of the likely demographics of the people who were complaining to us. At least, where do they live? What, where, let's try to understand a little bit more about who we're hearing from, the communities that we hear from. So as you can see from that chart there, you can see there's three lines, and it, it pretty starkly illustrates. So the, the green line um, are for communities that are predominantly white, well, as the concentrations of communities. So really what you want to focus on is the right side of that chart. You can see predominantly or heavily one of those um, populations according to the U.S. Census Bureau. So you can see that there's a marked difference between what we are hearing from um, uh, Hispanic communities communities that are predominantly or heavily Hispanic, um, we're hearing a much lower rate from those zip code areas than we are from predominantly white zip code areas. And even African American communities, uh, zip code areas, are a little bit they down, it's a, it, and they come up a little bit towards the end there, but still underneath um, what we're hearing from white communities. And again, it, it is the likely demographics, it's not certain, but it, it helps us to understand a little bit more about who we're hearing from. And the next slide will give you kind of a takeaway there, which you can see. So that's where we get our underreporting of fraud issue. In that data, um, the 2015 Consumer Sentinel data confirms that there are low complaint rates in Latino communities. In fact, it's 40% fewer complaints coming from those com communities. It also shows that both groups underreport fraud when compared to a higher prevalence of fraud. Uh, I'm going to show you that next. So we case illustrate. Oh, oh! Before I do that, I want to one other thing. One other thing that we looked at uh, for this report is um, also looked at the metropolitan areas um, across the country. Um, we looked at the complaint rates, and many times when we publish the complaint rates for the metropolitan areas. Um, we, we look at, so what communities are reporting the most fraud? What cities have the most fraud? But if you look at the opposite of that, the metropolitan areas, 100,000, um, populations of 100,000 or more, which ones have the low complaint rates? Where are those areas where we have a lot of people living but we're not getting a lot of complaints per capita? Um, and so we identified some of those, and you, you may not be surprised to hear that, that several of those um, are metropolitan areas with large Latino populations, given the previous numbers that I showed you. Um, at, in Texas and California, and for instance, we have a couple of places there along borders in particular. Um, and so part of our plan, which we're going to get to in a little bit here, is, is going to some of those areas where we're receiving a low uh, complaint ratios and trying to learn more about what's going on there. Okay to talk about a case illustration. So the next thing that we did is we had our researchers look at we had one case. This is just one, but it gives you a, a, it was kind of a quick example for us to look at. Um, and this was a case that, um, that it's a company we sued for taking unauthorized debits for consum from consumer bank accounts. Um, these were just, and what you'll find, well, let me jump to this. So in this case, it was a company that was um, making unauthorized debits um, and it actually, they got their list, their consumer list um, of, 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 these were mostly consumers who applied for payday loans online um, and I, I believe had been rejected, um, but they had this list and they just started debiting these accounts. 
Um, and when we, we had the actual victim list from the case, and we had that same researcher take a look at the zip codes of those victims um, and map that to the Census Bureau data, what we saw is on the next chart, um, which you can see that as you go to the right, where it is a predominantly or heavily African-American um, zip code area, uh, the number of victims went way up. That's four times what the other groups have there. So all this is concerning. Um, and then the next piece of that is, well, if you look at the complaints that we had received for that case, how that map, and, and even though the victimization rate was much higher, so that which consumers from areas with higher concentrations of African Americans complained, it was much lower than predominantly white areas, despite that higher victimization rate. Um, okay. There you can see the chart there. So that compares the complaints about that company, it's Ideal Financial Solutions was the name of the case, um, from the zip with concentrations of black, Hispanic, or white consumers. So that's my background research. So then, of course, what what are we doing? What, what are we doing? This this research confirmed a lot of what we've been hearing from many um, groups as we've been meeting. But what can we do? Um, and we this is our comprehensive plan that we've laid out in the report. And and it's probably not a surprise to see that it involves prevention, it is law enforcement, and it involves consumer education, um, and the report goes in detail of how to do that, just a high level of it. So for prevention, we are talking about raising awareness of fraud, talking about fraud, number one there. We have learned that people who talk with us when they receive suspicious requests for money are much more likely to avoid incurring financial loss. Just repeating the scammer's request can help question the scammer's responses. And you'll hear a lot of frauds will try to keep the victims isolated um, and not have them check, do a Google search, not check with a family member um, uh, before responding. You know, you must act now, you act quickly, those kinds of things. Um, but it's difficult to get people to talk about fraud. Um, and we have also heard that, you know, people, uh, by starting the conversation, even about one fraud, can really help make people aware and be constantly thinking about fraud. Even telling a story of being a hero of hanging up on a telemarketer can be a very engaging way for people to say, I had that happen too. And those kinds of conversations can be really powerful. Of course, reporting fraud, which I already mentioned, is a very important way to protect your community. Part with stakeholders, we've been doing a lot of that, but this kind of call, getting the word out, working with people who are already working with the communities um, that are trusted sources uh, on the front line is a valuable way of getting our information out, and we've been doing that. And we have, but we have plans to do much more because it's it's very, very important. Um, we've learned that that's how powerful that can be. We've also been working with the media. Uh, we have held a series of, of briefings across the country with ethnic media outlets. We've heard that it's very important to be in the ethnic media um, and these community uh, papers in language and, and in the communities already that are there, that have that are trusted, these trusted sources for information. So we've been doing that. Um, and then, uh, trying to expand our reach. As I mentioned, those low complaint areas, we're going to try and do a pilot program where we're doing some convenings to find out more about what's going on in those communities. Enforcement. Um, New scams trade on cultural connections in, in, in African American and Latino communities that really can just be siphoning money out of communities. We have brought uh, law enforcement cases um, alleging deceptive marketing of a whole variety of things, um, and we have them listed in our report. I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, but we have heard of scammers targeting recent immigrants from a variety of countries, preying on their need um, uh, related to immigration status. We've all heard of it with a variety of other things, uh, including the two types of schemes that I said we have seen a higher prevalence of, and these are schemes that exploit the need to work and to generate income. These are African Americans and Latinos, such as bogus work at home, work at opportunities, pyramid schemes, and business opportunity fraud, um, and we've listed some cases in the report there. We also have seen scams that prey on the need for financial stability 
uh, the, the, and, and debt-related scams. These are things such as credit repair scams, debt relief schemes, mortgage relief frauds, and advance fee loan offers. And, and of course, you saw that one case that I was saying about you know people who had applied for pay loans getting dinged. Uh, so we want complaints about these things. We certainly want your referrals if you're hearing things, even if the, the end consumer isn't interested in filing a complaint. Um, uh, you know, flagging for us, whether you file it as a complaint saying you've heard of this um, or you reach out to us, I, our contact information is at the end of this presentation. Um, you know, especially when we hear from people in the field who are seeing patterns and trends, um, it can be really helpful to us. We've brought many cases based on, particularly with our legal services outreach, um, legal services offices who have forwarded, you know, we, we think this is a problem in our community, those kinds of, of, of tips are fantastic. So um, I'm here today to say how important it is that that we want that to hear what's going on in these communities. Um, I will also say when you file a re when you file complaints in our system, none of the fields are actually required. Um, a consumer can put as little or as much information as they want when they file a complaint, meaning you don't have to put your name. Of course, it's able if we want to follow up individually, but you can file anonymous complaints there. And I want to say before I hand it over to Lisa, hopefully I'm not too long here. Um, we are planning a workshop on December 6th um, it's on changing demographics. We know that the country, uh, the population of this country is getting older and more racially and ethnically diverse. Uh, and we know that African American and Latino communities spending power is growing. And we want to understand more about how these communities are likely to change um, so that we're prepared and, uh, um, for these changes. So we are running this workshop. It will be webcast. It's in Washington, D.C., but it will be webcast, which is why I know many of you are throughout are, are based throughout the country. But I wanted to tell you about it because I think it's going to be a really um, important day where we're thinking about we're bringing in some demographers that are going to talk about the changing um, 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 the growth of these various groups and and cons potential concerns that can happen because we're having um, growth in different places. Where do we think the likely fraud is, is likely to go and what the likely consumer protection issues are going to be? And then um, have folks thinking about what we need to do to prepare. How do we change some of our priorities? How to shift resources to make sure we're ready for the future? And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Lisa Schifferly. Patty. Hi, everyone. My name is Lisa Schifferly. I'm an attorney in the FTC's Division of Consumer and Business Business education, where our job is to educate consumers about their rights and businesses about their responsibilities. And what I'm going to talk about today are some of the consumer education resources that we have to help you fight fraud in your communities. Now, generally, when we do consumer education, our audience for FTC materials is all consumers. But we found it effective to make some consumer education targeted at specific populations, including minority populations. So I'll tell you about some of that targeted consumer education, as well as our education on targeted scams like imposters, ID theft, and stalking apps. I've picked those targeted scams because imposters are the number three most prevalent scam that we get complaints about, and identity theft is number two. Um, in case you're wondering, debt collection is number one, and Patty already talked about that. So I'm going to cover imposters and ID theft, as well as stalking apps, sort of in on Domestic Violence Awareness Month and in recognition of the fact that we worked on this issue with NCVC Stalking Resource Center. Um, so let me get started by telling you a little bit about imposter scams and the materials we have there. Like I said, this is the number three scam reported to the FTC. It comes in a lot of different varieties. It can be what we call a grandparent scam where someone calls pretending to be your grandchild and they say, Grandma, I'm in jail in Mexico. Please send me money right away so I can get out. Out. It can be an IRS imposter scam where they say you owe money for back taxes and you're going to be put in jail or be arrested or even deported if you don't pay the taxes. Um, this is the most prevalent imposter scam in history for the IRS. Uh, also online dating scams where someone meets online and says, oh, I love you, but I need some money, wire it to me right away. And most recently, we've heard about a coyote scam where people will pretend to be coyotes who are bringing your family across the border and call you and say that they want money. The same upshot for all these imposter scams is they ask you to either wire money or put it on a prepaid card because then the money is not traceable. Another example I want to talk to you about um, is the Centro Natural case 
which did Latinos. It's a phantom debt collection case. And what happened there is that this company deceived Spanish speakers into paying money they didn't owe. It ranged in amounts from $2,000 to $9,000 at times. And they threatened arrest, immigration investigations, and other threats if the person did not pay this debt that they didn't even owe. So the FTC sued um, in court, and the court issued an injunction shutting down the company and prohibiting the company and the defendants from any sort of debt collection or telemarketing in the future. Um, this is just an example of how you know, Spanish-speaking marketing can be used to target certain populations with fraud. Some of the consumer education we have, and all of our consumer education is free and in the public domain, so you are free to copy it, reprint it verbatim. Um, this is about imposter scans at ftc.gov slash imposters, and we also have a Spanish version. It includes videos, articles, blogs. It covers the IRS scam, government imposters, tech support scams, grant scams, and others. We also have imposter scam materials specifically designed for older adults as part of our Pass It On campaign, um, which is a campaign for of older adults um, based on the premise that older adults are knowledgeable people who know about scams and can pass on that material to other people in their communities. It's also based on the premise that older adults in particular, based on our research, are more likely to accept that advice from another older adult or from a friend or a colleague rather than from the federal government. So this gives them the information to start conversations and talk to their friends and family about these scams. Next is in identity theft. Um, this is the number two scam that the FTC received complaints about last year. It affects 7% of the U.S. population and affects people regardless of age, race, or economic status. In fact, um, we've learned that Puerto Rican identities are particularly valuable um, because, as you all probably know, Puerto Ricans are U.S. citizens and U.S. citizens with Latino names, um, that personal information can be more valuable on the black market. So there was an incident where all Puerto Rican birth certificates were stolen from a warehouse and the government had to reissue all the birth certificates. This is an example of how identity theft can affect different populations. We have some great new tools for identity theft victims, including identitytheft.gov, which you'll see here. It allows people to report identity theft and get a personal recovery plan covers over 30 types of ID theft. It's available in Spanish as well. That upper right-hand corner in blue gives the link to the Spanish version of identitytheft.gov. And everything on this site, it gives you um, just to do's. It gives you sample forms that are filled out, pre-filled with your information and letters. And if you do it in Spanish, it will give you the Spanish version so you can read and understand it. And then also the English version to send to businesses, to the credit reporting agencies. We also have a lot of print materials that we have just revised um, in order to have the look and feel of identitytheft.gov and have the updated advice of identitytheft.gov. There's our, on the far left, a recovery plan, which is our guidance for identity theft victims and walks through all the steps. It has a lot of the sample forms that I mentioned that are available online. And then the next four are shorter, just, um, you know, bifold publications that generic what to know, what to do about identity theft. It gives you the very first steps, and then you to identitytheft.gov for more. We have one in particular for military, which talks about active duty alerts, a special kind of fraud alert when you're deployed. We have one about child identity theft, um, what to do if your child's identity is stolen, how to request a manual search for credit, and how to get a child credit freeze if it's available in your state. And finally, we have one um, for data breaches because you know most people in this country at this point have been a victim of some sort of data breach and had their personal information exposed there. The last um, type of, of spread I want to talk about before I get into the targeted materials for certain populations are stalking apps. The FD recently published a blog called Who's Stalking? And again, I said we worked with this with NCVC Stalking Center. I talked about what to do if you think a stalking app may be on your phone. It's very hard to tell if it's on there because your phone may look the same, but there are certain tips that you can look for, like did the 
potential perpetrator have physical access? Do they know a lot of information that they wouldn't otherwise know? Are there unexplained charges on your bill? Or do you have trouble turning it off? And then there's advice like getting help from a domestic violence hotline to see if your phone's been jailbroken um, using root checker apps, hacking up your phone to preserve evidence and um, possibly resetting your phone and re reinstalling the operating system to remove the stocking up. So materials on three prevalent scams affecting all populations, and then materials that are targeted at particular populations. I mentioned passing on before, which are materials for active older adults. Um, in addition to the imposter scam materials, we have our original passing on materials, which cover issues like healthcare scams, charity scams, lottery scams. All of these are available in Spanish too at ftc.gov slash pasalo. And then for the Latino community, um, we have a bunch of photonovelas, which have been very, very popular. Uh, we won the Clearmark Award for Plain Language for the Best Spanish Language Publication. And over 850,000 have been ordered in Spanish since July of 2014 when we first launched them. And what we learned for this is it's important when doing consumer education not just to do it in the receipt group's language, but also to incorporate part of the culture. And as you may know, photonovelas are traditional comic books that originated in Mexico. They're easy to read, engaging, and provide a way for people to model behavior. Um, so we've created ones that cover government imposters, income scams, notario scams, car buying, and debt relief. And there are more on the way. So have target information for immigrants. And this is not just for Spanish-speaking immigrants. As you'll see on the left, um, we have these materials in a range of other languages. It, it explains how to get reliable immigration help. It covers the notario fraud issue, but also covers other things like the green card, diversity, visa, lottery scams, and how to avoid them. It also has FAQs about immigration forms, checking your application status, and things like that. We have even more specialized uh, information for recent refugees. This was just put out about a year ago. Again, it covers a range of languages, including Amharic, Arabic, Dari, French, Somali, and Spanish. It gives quick tips for refugees on avoiding scams and protecting their personal information. Things like how to spot a fake job offer and how to avoid lottery scams and a lot more. We know, um, all of these materials and a lot more can be ordered at ftc.gov slash bulk order. Um, these are free. I want to emphasize that again. You can get as many of these as you want for free by going to this website. The shipping is free. Everything is free. Publications are in English and in Spanish. Some of them also have other languages, like those immigration publications that I mentioned. Um, one thing we've found very effective in terms of outreach to African American populations is getting a lot of these publications in large African American churches. Um, if you work with any of those churches, you can order publications for the church and when you give presentations or just to have out there at community events. A couple other resources I want to tell you about before I wrap up. One is consumer.gov or consumidor.gov in Spanish. This is all our materials are plain language, but this is really plain language designed for our lower literacy audience. It was done in response to legal services providers who said that you know, our materials really needed to be at a lower literacy level to reach a lot of their clients. So it covers issues like budgeting, finance, managing money, identity theft, and it also has an audio read-along component. And then we have videos available at YouTube, FT videos, all of these you can grab. And I encourage you to, to encourage others you work with about reporting scams. You can do it in English or in Spanish. There's the phone numbers and the links, as Patty said, we see that underreporting is a big problem, especially for minority populations. So we want to make sure that minority groups know how to report fraud to the FTC. It often helps to have a trusted entity like yours to tell them that. Now, ways that you can partner with the FTC. Um, please do use, edit, and share our materials. It's a great way to get 
free heroes and materials translated into other languages. Um, talk about fraud, which you're already doing. Encourage people to report fraud to us. And so um, don't be scared to tell us when you see fraud. Um, you can email Patty, you can email me. We have brought several cases that have been referred to us from legal services providers. So it is worthwhile reaching out to us if you see a pattern or practice in your area that you think might be right for a case. And if you want to learn more and keep on top of the latest developments at the FTC, you can go to ftc.gov slash stay connected to get our scam alerts and consumer information updates. Here's our email contact information. Um, we'll take questions at the end of everyone's presentations, but you're also welcome to contact each one of us uh, after the presentation. Now I will pass this over to Mikhail. Everybody, this is Nathaniel Carroll um, with Arch City Defenders, and I'm I'm here with Mika Ornbaum from Kingdom House, um, and presenting together because we um, we've joined forces in a way to to try to to solve a lot of the uh, after aftershock uh, of consumer related issues. Uh, specifically, we're, we see a lot of, uh, of sort of financial uh, exploitation that happens when people are either in low income or a, a high debt scenario or often a combination of both. Uh, Park City Defenders is uh, a nonprofit law firm. We represent homeless and uh, impoverished people um, in both nonviolent offender uh, situations like at municipal court and um, and also in the in the in the state and uh, sometimes federal level. We also bring uh, what we call impact litigation, which would be class actions, sort of um, cutting out the systemic constitutional, unconstitutional practices of various government entities um, in in the St. Louis region. Um, and those are federal cases brought on a national level. Um, one of the I wanted to 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 talk about is what what we see when you know in in all of our clients. One thing that that both RCD Defense and Kingdom House see is that our, our clients are, are often, uh, because they're Im impoverished, um, often, uh, and it's probably not a surprise, they're, they're members of minority populations. And they're all dealing with um, a, quite a bit of stress. In fact, for the, if they're facing uh, ordinance charges that for, for, well, crimes of poverty, which would be like uh, failure to register your vehicle or, or let it expire. Or a failure to provide proof of insurance, or driving on a suspended license, broken light—all of these things are uh, "quote unquote" crimes that, that different communities uh, have, have have to the privilege of driving a car. But they're also a result of not having a living wage, not having enough income, and so um, that that when they come to us with that problem. There might have active warrant for their arrest, but the fourth or fifth uh, priority on their list compared to the other things that they're dealing with that are causing them uh, stress. And, um, and so I'm not a psychologist or a therapist, but I, I, I can see uh, very clearly the effects of, of sort of toxic stress that, um, that, that, that that environment and um, because of, of the population that they're a part of, and see what that does to someone's decision making skills and ability to um, prevent themselves from being scammed or to to recognize in the moment we're feeling desperate that the payday loan or the subprime auto loan at a, a buy here or pay here type uh, car lot is, is not the best decision. So um, on the one hand, you know, an important component to edging consistent educating our and especially victims who are in a vulnerable position, um, they're more more likely to make, you know, decisions um, sort of with what what would feel good at the time. Scammers know that people are in that position. That can make that, that's who their mark is. That's who they can they can take advantage of. Um, another thing that we we often see, uh, whether it is uh, a, a, a really deceptive. Practice, or whether it's just an unfair or usurious interest rate, 
um, a lot of the predatory businesses um, technically might be operating under the law, but perhaps they're violating a lot of other consumer rights and consumer laws, and many of our clients don't even realize that this, the product they purchased or the loan that they took out uh, has some sort of illegal component to it. There's this presumption of legality, and so when we have uh, clients come to us, we, tr we try to provide a holistic reputation. So we take care of the municipal issue, but a lot of times they have uh, trouble, trouble maintaining housing, maintaining employment, and then uh, on top of that, they uh, supplement that whole They'll they'll take into these products like payday loans and that sort of thing, and that's where we kind of uh, where house comes in to help financial equity and and knowledge in in the participants. So Mika, you want to talk about that? Absolutely. Hi, hey, Mika here. Um, I'm a financial social worker um, at King House, um, and we have a financial stability program here where we work with with already of low income folks, uh, primarily African American and Latino uh, clients who uh, have uh, financial goals or are facing some financial uh, barriers um, and have come to us for, for support. What we hear is um, work individually but also in groups, we created uh, economic or financial uh, support groups. And also, um, through partnerships with a lot of local experts, created a really fabulous, um, I think, uh, financial literacy program that partners um, woven into the coaching and support groups that we offer. Um, I think the reason why I'm on uh, this uh, presentation today is to talk a little bit about what frontline providers can um, look for and what they can do um, as folks who aren't attorneys um, or, who, or, for folk, or who don't work for larger, um, you know, region organizations. Um, for me, the majority of my clients have experienced some um, example of, of all the things that, are, that, that uh, the other presenters are talking about today. Um, advertising, unfair pricing and terms, um, Distinctive uh, contracts, um, you know, uh, messages to their to their cell phones about their student loans, um, enormous interest rates, uh, also scams for signing up for uh, federal student loan forgiveness, where folks are being charged to sign up for free programs. Um, we really see it all at the financial coaching level, and so. When this position, I thought it would be about, uh, uh, you know, emotionally interviewing my clients and helping them change their budgeting and, and you know, addressing their, their spending and their uh, credit reports. I quickly found that there's immense um, barriers and systems designed um, and uh, enforced by local <laughs> policies often. Uh, St. Louis is the um, unregulated in a lot of ways, specifically payday lending and um, subprime lending. Um, so when I found that I kept hearing the same stories over and over and over again, I realized that COVID wasn't just about what um, clients were doing. It was actually that they were facing larger um, issues that are that are regulated or poorly regulated or that they're not even realizing are actually scams or legal or because they had um, maybe missed a payment or you know because they didn't have the money to hold their end of the deal that they couldn't then take any action against sort of illegal or unclear uh, agreement or contract with, with various um, institutions. Um, kind of leads uh, me to uh, why Kingdom House, a um, organization with a financial stability program, decided to partner with a um, profit organization like Arch City, which Nathaniel will speak 
speak a little bit about now. Right. So um, <clears throat> the slide we have up here will, will kind of uh, help illustrate this. This is uh, an attempt to, to make an uh, illustration of, of this sort of cyclical uh, pattern of, of where we are clients uh, at various points along the way, and, and, and they often get trapped. So um, RD clients, I mean, one of our primary goals in providing sort of direct representation and one-on-one -on -one uh, representation and advocacy for a particular uh, homeless individual or family, or even just as someone who's on the brink of homelessness, which is a, a, a in a, in in our 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 city and this region is uh, a lot of people. So we let's imagine that we are able to uh, the barriers to housing, and we we get them into affordable housing, and we even connect them and with employment. The, often the, the next thing that happens uh, or is that we've, we've done all that and this person uh, or an individual might work 40 a week, it's still not a living wage and that's, you know, that's both a local issue and a, a national issue that we, I think, we understand. Um, they, uh, they have to have to paying the bills, right? They have to, they have to, to, to be to get to work, which means maybe purchasing a car um, or, or depending on, on someone else to, for, for transportation. But, um, and another problem is in Missouri, they did, uh, we did not expand Medicaid after the Care Act was passed. And so there's a big gap for, for people who are earning, um, earning just enough to, to not qualify for the state Medicaid, um, but, but don't nearly earn enough to actually afford the insurance or the, the co-pays uh, on the marketplace. And then you add in another little wrinkle that in, in maybe every city, uh, but definitely in, this, in, in our region, we have 90 different municipalities, uh, which are tiny little governments that each have their own mayors and clerks and courts and judges and police departments. And it, it, it is sustained rating all those is to generate revenue. And the way they do that is through issuing traffic tickets and property nuisance tickets. And a lot of times, I mean, most of the, the traffic tickets that, that are issued um, in, in these various municipalities, as, as we found at Arch City, um, they're there for what we call crimes of poverty. I mentioned that earlier. So things things that are, are, are violations of ordinances that are tied to someone's ability to pay for those things. And each of these tips might come a court appearance, might be during the day, might be at night, but most most people or many people cannot afford to take the time to find child care or to miss work to go to court. So then a warrant with a bond is issued and might get locked up and they lose their job. So that's where you get into this little orange circle here. Uh, a lot of different uh, factors that can affect someone's financial situation and make them vulnerable and susceptible to uh, either just dangerous products or deceptive or, or, or scam products. Things like uh, payday loans, overdraft fees, um, and subprime auto loans, debt consolidation scams. Uh, an example here in St. Louis, there are billboards and, on buses and on uh, on the on the roadways that appear to be Avenues for financial uh, financial counseling or credit repair. Uh, we specialize in bankruptcy, and if you call the number or you go to the address, it turns out it's just a used car lot, and and they they promise that they can pay or you can buy here, pay here, and you'll repair your credit. But what you're really doing is buying uh, buying a vehicle that is probably not, not uh, in great shape, and you're buying it without a warranty. Uh, might sell you a warranty on top of that, which sometimes turns into a scam. But but really, what you're doing is financing at 30 or 40 percent of this $2,000 piece of that break down, and then you've got to find a car, and you get desperate, and so then uh, you end up having multiple car payments. And what happens after that is uh, is partly um, is, is, most time you end up in court. Uh, and, and a lot of people don't even make it to court because of the same reasons. Um, but just as much as the 
we we know that that in the criminal, the criminal uh, system in our courts, we try to point people to uh, like public defenders to represent people when um, they they jail. Um, in the civil system, there's there's no such there's mechanism to prevent catastrophic results where maybe legitimate or, or illegal contracts um, are brought before the court. And because there are so many of them filed, and not not everybody shows up, the courts end up becoming this default judgment machine. In particular, that's dangerous because we don't have any caps on judgment interest rate. And so, if if an attorney for a subprime auto lender comes with his 50 cases that day, and 40 of them don't show up, he takes that step of 40 default judgments. And puts her interest rate was on the contract on judgment, and then that juice keeps going. They can garnish people's wages, um, and they can repossess the vehicles if they're still operating, and seize bank accounts. And so, as much as we can educate people, you know, a long way, and say, hey, don't don't do that anymore. Chance are they've already they've already you know. Um, and victim to one of these things, they're going to get caught in that orange piece. And so, what that that uh, King House in Arch City is trying to do is um, is to simply be an advocate, to to stand with the people, to to stand shoes sometimes and go to court for them, or uh, help them address these um, these problems that that maybe are scary for them, that cause more stress. Uh, them vulnerable to more, more scams. Um, and so if on my end I take care of all of the criminal things and I take care of, of a few of the um, a few housing issues, they still other component that that the house can help educate them and identify, and then we can send them in court. We, um, most of the time, if you have an attorney. In a debt collection case, for example, uh, whether it's legitimate or not, uh, you can get the interest knocked off and settle for half to thirds off of the original amount. And just uh, that's just, just most just a product of, of um, sort of for wrench in the gears, um, slowing the process down. It's a base business for most of these scammers. So that's what we're trying to do. Mika here. So, um, so what I think Nathaniel and I really want to emphasize with when on this panel um, is really what we can do um, as, as partners. Um, you know, on the previous slide, we noticed that, you know, as, as organizations and as single people, um, Doing our day-to-day, -day, we have limitations. Um, for me, of course, it's that I'm not an attorney. Um, and but but being what we were able to find, our city who could provide that direct representation could help us here as, at Kingdom House as coaches, financial um, you know kids to understand the nuances of con of consumer rights, to understand um, what our Local and regional and national, um, you know, regulations actually protect um, our clients from, and we then become the mouthpiece. We then become the, um, you know, educators and the investigators with our clients for them, to, you know, in order to to convey all of that information. And then as we see things coming up and we see trends, in, in the same way that I think. BC does, but what we see locally, we can, you know, send these cases to um, Arch City, who, since they take on uh, class action and, and, you know, look, they also look for trends in these sorts of uh, violations and abuses, we can move forward, not only just educating folks, but also getting, uh, you know, uh, folks, uh, you know, money and um, time restored after they've been victims of of uh, different violations of their rights. Because, um, I think 
people need to understand how I'm financially healthy, that that's a, everyone's personal responsibility, and that's why we have a coaching program, which holds folks accountable to that and, and fill in the gray spots. Um, but what I think is incredible about our partnership is that we then work with folks after, um, you know, they have had this direct representation to make them better consumers for them to also uh, become really fluent in, in these scams and what to look for and how to talk to their family and friends and communities about what dangerous um, products and contracts are, you know, in your neighborhood, in the city, and and, and beyond. So um, I, I hope that that uh, is what folks can take away um, from, from our part in sharing uh, what we're trying to do in St. Louis. Do you want to add anything, Nathaniel? No, I just encourage others to um, find services that, that represent the same kinds of uh, populations that um, already didn't start as a, a you know, sort of financial, um, financial advocacy law firm, um, but but we're helping people that had poverty and and are overlapping victims of these scams and 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 these. Uh, Financial products that have, you know, unfair, deceptive components to them. So, um, the can a lot of. I think there's a tendency to, to work in house and try to do everything, ish, uh, and maybe even in the nonprofit world be the the, the best at a certain uh, certain thing or, or get more clients and funding. But working together with uh, with other social service organizations helps the individual clients on a holistic level. Um, sort of it powers them and then helps them break free that, that little vortex of of, uh, of that that are really tied to systemic um, systemic barriers. So thanks. We'll be around for questions at the end. Thank Hi, this is Brett. Um, I'm with Texas Appleseed, um, and I just uh, wanted to talk a bit about Texas Appleseed and how the coalition, which we call the Texas Fair Lending Alliance, has actually, um, identified and addressed fraud in, in one particular instance. Um, before I get there, I just want to say Texas Appleseed, um, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, with it, we are a public interest justice center. Our mission is to promote social and economic justice for all Texans. Uh, we leverage skills and resources of pro bono attorneys and other professionals. Uh, so we aren't a direct service organization. We um, instead uh, lobby and do some grassroots organizing uh, advocacy at the state level as well. Um, so some of the issues we work on are the school to prison pipeline, fair housing, and then uh, in this case, uh, fair financial services, which has primarily focused on payday and auto title lending reform. Um, so with respect to the STC's report, uh, it was really interesting to us because it's something that we certainly have seen anecdotally. Uh, and actually, if you look at these graphs, you can see that most of the um, payday and auto title lenders in Texas are um, borrowers who belong to communities of color. Um, and so in the Texas payday loan market, 68% of loan borrowers uh, identify as non-white. Um, and the auto title uh, borrowers, 55% of them identify as, as non-white. Um, and just for a little bit of comparison sake, um, this is about 32% Hispanic or Latino, 12 and black, and about 4% um, Asian and American um, Indian. So it is actually quite disproportionate. Um, in Texas, unfortunately, payday lending is very legal and very uh, abusive, even if it, it's own legal. We have some of the highest um, APRs in the country. But on that, we also see a lot of fraud um, in the market. The other presenters have touched on this, so I just will breeze through these. But these primary things that we hear about, even as you know, a policy organization, um, 
from a lender. So if you need that, uh, in particular on online lending and lead generators, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, where you put info in, it usually looks like it's a payload um, or other other loan, it actually isn't, and that person then has information and can sell it to uh, many parties that you might not have even realized when you first put in, thinking you were getting a loan. Um, abusive collections practices, which is what um, I'm going to focus on in a, a, a slide. Um, so we've seen this mostly in what the other presenters have highlighted, you know, scaring people with threats of criminal prosecution. I've also seen it with actual filing of criminal complaints for debt, um, which is uh, contrary to Texas law, but it's still um, being done. Um, and fraudulent debt collection, um, so, you know, uh, phantom debt that people don't own, uh, things they've already paid, and um, fraudulent debt settlement services, so tell you're going to get them out of payday loans or other debt, um, often remind them to pay up front and then not, never delivering on those on those things, on those services or promises. Um, so Technical Seed is, is part of a group called the Texas Fair Lending Alliance. Um, and as I mentioned before, our main goal is to, to try and make payday lending or reform, uh, our title lending reform reality and create product work for um, borrowers and lenders. And we have a statewide group um, of contacts from direct service providers, uh, religious organizations, community partners, um, ranges. And we have a state network now for assistance and referrals. We have a collective knowledge base um, of consumer experiences. We've also done research so that we know what fraud is going on. Um, and our policy initiatives then can build on that research. Um, in terms of how we reach consumers, obviously, as I mentioned, some of our partners are direct service providers, so they have those community relationships. But in addition, um, we found that the VIA is a good way, and, and that actually leads into my next slide, which talks about a sort of example of um, the threat and filing of criminal complaints to collect civil debts. So what I'm talking about here is a payday loan. Someone goes and gets it. Um, a man would call us uh, after calling his state representative who knew about us through the Texas Fair Lending Alliance. Um, he was in Houston, but the loan company um, from which he borrowed money filed a um, criminal complaint in a San Antonio court to collect um, on debt. So. Like I said, that's actually quite contrary to Texas law. Um, but this criminal com or his call to us uh, about the criminal complaint led us to investigate it further. And so we did an open records request and were able to figure out that over, there were over 2,000 instances where this was going on. Uh, often they were certain businesses filing in friendly venues, so like the same courts over and over again um, to get pretty easy, um, either most of the time actually what would happen is they did have to have some action in it, so they have to take the charges uh, for like they're filing for a, a, a bad check. Um, it's not what happens when you get a payday loan. You're you're doing a post-dated check to pay it a, a date. You're not saying you have that money in your account. Um, so they were using that to file the criminal complaint. Uh, and you guys, I think, well, what we found, and this is more anecdotal, but people would take because they were afraid. Um, so it was fraud uh, and, and contrary to law. And so we did an open records request, and with media, with a lot of media coverage, uh, we started getting more complaints of people calling us asking for help, mostly with uh, actual threats of criminal prosecution, not, not complaints. But actually led us to be more um, to create some sort of an outward facing tool, uh, probably some kind of web and toolkit along with um, videos about what people have um, under the Fair Debt Collection Practice Act at the state and the federal level, and you know why why what's going on with the filing criminal complaints is against this law. 
And in addition, um, with the filing complaint, um, criminal complaints, we were able to, you know, file uh, complaints with our state regulator, with the CFPB, um, and because the state regulator issued a, a bulletin to all payday and auto title lenders saying that this was, you know, against the law. Um, some some of the companies actually ended up paying fines uh, to the state regulator. And in addition, there's an ongoing lawsuit, uh, an attempt at a class action, which is, is tricky because of the arbitration um, provisions in a lot of these contracts. But it, it's, um, it's, in, it's has been successful at the trial court level and then has been arbitration at the appeals and the attorney is currently appealing it. And all of that came out of one consumer contact um, about uh, who was referred to us. Um, I just think that's an interesting example. And, you know, with its tie to the FCC's research, um, you know, most of the people that are in these complaints that have gotten these complaints and threats are in minority um, communities. Uh, last slide is just my contact information. If anyone had questions or wanted to learn more or connect with Apple in any of the work uh, that we do. So thank you so much. I'll pass it back to the host. Oh, are you still here? I kind of lost uh, Laura, the Deputy Director of our Financial Crime Resource Center, but uh, thanks, for every, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. I uh, hope you found this helpful. We have a couple questions that I'll take over and pass on to our presenters here. I have one of the questions that was intended for me, if that's helpful. This is Lisa Schifferle at the FTC. Yeah, um, um, and someone had asked uh, what it means to have a phone jailbroken or rooted. And basically, jailbroken is the term for an Apple device and rooted is the term for an Android device. And the meaning is the same. It's just to remove the software restrictions that were put on the phone by Apple or by the Android provider, and it allows control over the phone's operating system and basically allows unrestricted administrative access. So in fact, the stalker can get into your GPS information or get into your camera without your knowledge. So our advice to people if they're not sure if their phone has been jailbroken is that you can use something called a root checker app to check if it's been jailbroken. Um, you can Google root checker app to find that, um, but of course it's important to be where the stalker may be able to see what you're doing on your phone, including checking for root checker apps or, you know, swiping your phone. So it's important for people to work with domestic violence counselors and others to figure out the safest plan for their particular situation. Thanks. Well, this is Laura. I'm, I'm so Sam. Thanks for taking over. I'm so sorry. I, I got disconnected and I. I Look on the screen, I was still there, but um, thank, I want to thank all the presenters for sharing this really excellent knowledge with us. Obviously, the idea for this webinar came about as a result of the FTC study, uh, it's such an important study, and we've gotten so much important information from it. We actually had a question about one of the slides reference. It was the fifth slide um, of C present uh, PowerPoint where it indicated in Hispanic populations, uh, complaint rates significantly decrease. In black populations, they decrease somewhat, but then in, toward the end, and in white populations, they steadily increased. Did you all find reasons as to why that occurred? Thanks, this is Patty. So I, I don't know uh, exactly. Um, um, this is one of the things as I was describing at the beginning uh, or, or when I mentioned that we are looking at some of these metropolitan areas where we have low complaint rates and we're going to go out and do some convenings to, to talk with the folks there to get um, you know, more insights onto that uh, and that would probably help. Certainly we know from our conferences and, and meetings with people and, and uh, you know from 
more anecdotally from our, from our research, you know, anecdotal research, that we have heard certainly that there are a lot of reasons why um, particularly Hispanics may not want to talk with the government um, and, and that we're not a trusted source, which is why, as we, Lisa and I were talking, we we've, find it really important for the government, particularly the federal government, to work with um, people in the communities already, stakeholders and, and groups already are trusted sources to share our information, that seems to be a much more effective tool than saying, hey, we're from the, the federal government and we want to talk with you. Um, so that's that's one approach we've taken. But sorry, I don't really know. I'm hoping that we're going to be able to do a little bit more of a drill down. This was kind of our first step. Okay, and, and this question is along the same lines. Has the FTC documented effects of outreach programs in these targeted communities? Right. So, so this is, again, that is another one of those things that's it's really difficult. We were happy to have this data by looking at our, our um, complaint data. That's the first time we've, we've issued complaint data every year, but this is the first time we've done more of a drill down and we're hoping to do more of it. Um, but being able to track the effects of outreach is, it, is very difficult. I mean, we've had a lot of conversations about ways to do that. I will say that, two, and we don't have a great solution. I'm guessing there are people who are thinking, hey, what do you do to track it so that we could do it too and, and, you know, be able to say how effective something is. Hard to measure because when we put out, you know, big initiatives, often that generates more complaints about a topic, not less, which is good. We want more of those complaints, but it doesn't demonstrate that the problem is, is being solved. The other side of that is, of course, some of the those pieces that Lisa, of education that Lisa was describing, our Pass It On campaign for older adults, and those photo novellas for, um, for uh, the Latino community. I mean, we certainly have seen, you know, incredible um, requests for that. The numbers are very high. I don't know them off the top. Lisa, do you the numbers? The photo novellas was 850,000 since July 2014. Which is pretty hefty. Uh, those are paper, you know, print versions. So, um, and we certainly, you know, like we get a lot of hits on our website, but but we can track that way. But what I think what the question is, how can you track the effectiveness of something? And that is a much harder question. It's a great question. We'll hope to see something that maybe come out of the next study. That would be great. Um, and, and somebody asked, they said they had several victims come into their office requesting assistance regarding lack of effort in the investigation of fraud. What can you do when police are unwilling to follow up with information provided by victims? Uh, that is hard. Um, and, and I should have said that too, when we take complaints, you know, just because a complaint is filed in Sentinel doesn't mean somebody's going to immediately respond um, and, and necessarily bring a case for it. Um, and so, because as I was saying, it's the, our, our data is used for, um, you know, targets and, and finding, collecting information about targets and, and being used by lots of different law enforcement sources. It's also used for patterns and trends, which so that's really important too, uh, as we try to figure out what to focus on. Um, but I'm saying that because I think it's important to keep trying and to file complaints with multiple agencies. As annoying as that is, and as diff I don't have a great solution for this, I mean, we've raised this at several conferences, you really do want to keep trying. Um, and if one agency or uh, enforcement group says no, trying another, whether it's the state AG, the Better Business Bureau, your, your local county consumer protection group, another federal agency, you know, just it's it's all I can, that's about the best advice I can give. Lisa, do you have something else? Just to add to that, also a lot of U.S. attorney's offices have victim witness coordinators, um, and those people may be able to assist the victim in terms of getting help from the police and getting access to all sorts of other resources. They're available to victims of fraud, not just violent crimes. Uh, Daniel, Mikhail, and Brett, have you guys had any, you know, had any success when people are coming to you and saying, "Police won't help me"? Have you been able to find anything that you could do in those scenarios? Just uh, Nathaniel, I, I don't. A lot of times, um, we are helping people who are victims by the police here. So, um, but wow. but as far as measuring success. Um, a lot of times, uh, if it's once something's gotten to the point where someone's being sued, and we at that point we can identify any potential defenses if there's some sort of fraud involved, um, we've been able to uh, 
much of the effectiveness of an attorney in these unfair collection scenarios, for example, is by entering an appearance on the court case, um, we can we can safely expect to uh, knock off at least a third or even a half of the person's uh, monetability uh, just because they have an attorney on their side. And it might be something that was uh, cost prohibitive from them before, and the lawyer's attorneys know that, and the scammer's attorneys know that, and, and they try to exploit that. So that's how we, we measure our success. We had a gentleman who was a senior citizen, he was a widower, and there was a, a, a collector was trying to get a couple thousand bucks for him, plus plus interest, and um, we were able to negotiate that in half and set up a, a fair payment plan. I mean, it was a, a legitimate debt, more or less, but when that, um, and he, he wanted to pay off, but he didn't have to pay the extremely high interest rates and, and, and things like that. So we were able to, and, and he was referred from Kingdom House, uh, where, where Mika was helping him with many different problems uh, and, and resolving a lot of consumer issues that, that was after his wife died. So... Brett probably has more success stories there, though. So. Uh, <laughs> I wish I did. I guess what I would add is I think that this is a real limitation. You know, that per caller that we had talked to who had the criminal um, complaint filed, and, you know, sure, them to go to the Office of the Attorney General, but that's been our only sort of go-to, and we hadn't discovered sort of the mass in the high number of people that is happening to, I, I don't think that the system would have handled it the same way. I think, you know, the lack of volume tends to be a problem with this stuff and, and the low level nature sometimes of the, the amounts, which are you know, their level when you don't know some things, I guess, that these regulators are dealing with, although I think in mass it's a huge issue and I, I don't mean to minimize it. Um, I, I do think, you know, we always tell people to file with the Attorney General, to file with the state regulator, to complain to the CFP, to the FPC. Um, but it, it is something that is a challenge. And I think one of the, the reasons we got around it in this case was being able to find a mass of people it was happening to. One for your input there. Um, and we had one last question about the studies. Uh, does the study focus on um, a particular, particular areas of the country, or is it more national? Uh, so this, Patty, again from the FTC. Uh, the study was was na national. It was, it was the, the report includes um, the information across the nation for our complaints. But we do publish every year. The Federal Trade Commission publishes in February um, the uh, a report of all of the complaints that have come in the in the previous year, and that is broken out by state. But what it will show, it's not going to show you the demographic information I gave you. What we published is just like the numbers, the types of complaints, the topic areas for each state. But that that part is broken out geographically. Okay. And then we have one last question um, asking if NCVC has a list of similar organizations, uh, like the organizations the presenters are from. Uh, while I don't have a, a list per se, NCVC has a huge database of victim service providers uh, assisting with cross the board. So we we do this, um, you know, homicide, sex crimes, financial fraud, and pretty much everything in our database includes all that information. So we do have a good deal of organizations help with financial fraud and financial issues in that database, um, and that is available to our helpline, which is the Victim Connect Resource Center. Um, it's the numbers on our website. It's one eight five five four victim. Uh, victims of any sort of crime can call that number and be connected with local resources. So, say we have somebody from Texas or St. Louis, we can try to put them in touch with. Uh, Brett, Mika, Nathaniel, uh, if we get people from other places, hopefully we can have find a local resource or we have a local resource that we can connect that victim with. And I believe that's all for the questions today. So we'll end there. Thank you to all of the participants for coming. And uh, again, a big thank you to all the presenters for your time and efforts. It's really appreciated. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us.